and uh, thank all of you for for having me. This is really an honor. Um, <laughs> I told, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I told Tom I'd slip him a 20 if he said something nice about me in my intro, so <laughs> that's probably where he got all of that. Um, well, let me uh, jump into my presentation here. Um, yeah, again, big honor to be here. Um, Going to bring up a slideshow I have. So, um, <laughs> just hang on, bear with me while I share my screen. I'm sorry, just one, one second here. Okay, there we go. Almost. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, I'm actually kind of new to Zoom, if you can't tell. So tonight, I wanted to start by first just introducing myself a little bit, actually kind of going over some of the same stuff Tom talked about, and then um, talking about what direction I chose and what got me there, um, and then what I do now. And that kind of gives me an excuse to do like a greatest hits of some of my, especially warblers. I'm kind of talking more about warblers tonight than anything else. And then that brings me around to um, seeing the warblers on their wintering territory and uh, learning more recently about um, how uh, some of our um, coffee choices, for example, affect them on their wintering grounds. Um, I've just been really kind of fascinated by that lately. So that kind of brings it full circle. Um, so like Tom said, when I was six, I don't know what possessed me. Grew up in the woods. I just, for whatever reason, nonstop, uh, had a pair of binoculars and I wanted to make images of birds. Didn't have a camera yet, but you can see me there with, uh, uh, Robert Bateman's book, Drawing an Eagle and Looking at a Field Guide. And for whatever reason, I wanted to make my own field guide. So that gave me an excuse to like really observe each species and study it. And I memorized it from a really early age. Um, I was looking at Robert Bain's book. I was about six and um, discovered Bateman's book in a bookstore and was really drawn to it. And I asked for it for Christmas and got it. Um, Bateman is a really well-known uh, nature painter. There's a lot of like amazing nature artists out there. Um, some have incredible technical proficiency, and Bateman has amazing technical proficiency, but um, he had a background as an artist. And I think he started as an abstract expressionist, and I think some of his um, sensibilities as an abstract painter, the form and formalism of that comes through in his, in his paintings, and that always really appealed to me. And so I've drawn from his books since I was a very young kid. Um, this is a uh, one of his paintings made in 84 of a scarlet tanager, just an example of his work, um, one of his songbirds. And you'll see the bird is a little smaller in the frame. It actually is not looking at the viewer, it has a diverted gaze, but that brings us back into the composition. And it's sitting on a branch, which makes sense with um, the scarlet tanager, which comes back, arrives on breeding territory and nests in maple forests. It's sitting here on maple branch. So the, the, the branch relates to the bird's um, natural history. And then also I like the color palette. It's a, a homogenous color palette, but the, the bright red of the, of the tanager kind of still gives it hierarchy or the composition. Anyways, it is, it is kind of an example of his work, but it always really impacted me. And um, eventually I had the opportunity to meet him as a kid. And um, my uncle saw my passion and uh, he had an extra SLR camera which he gave me and um, 
a 200 millimeter lens and a 2x and I quickly found that I liked uh, taking pictures uh, with the camera as much as I liked drawing. Um, I later got a degree in, in, in art with a concentration in painting and photography. Um, my photography was influenced very early on by Arthur Morris. Some of you know him. Um, everyone knows he has a strong personality. He's always been like just really generous with me. Um, but I grew up, he, so Arthur Morris, I think is, is we can credit with, for a lot of people, um, making bird photography into something that we can do just for fun. I think a long time ago, um, nature photography was, like an elitist thing for people on National Geographic assignments. But Arthur Morris wrote these pamphlets and then later the Art of Bird Photography, which kind of explained, um, you know, it's a fun thing to do, um, buy this equipment, go to these places, use these settings, you too can make good photos. And as a kid, I was like, yeah, maybe I could. Um, and then later, when I was about 20, Arthur Morris was giving a presentation in Cleveland, Ohio, and I called him up and said, hey, I'll be your chauffeur for the weekend if you, uh, if you don't mind me asking you some questions about, about uh, what you do and what your advice would be to a young man getting started. And so he was very kind and said yes. Um, I took him to some of my favorite locations in the Cleveland area and, like this. This was photographed side by side with him. And, um, and uh, he, he, he helped me a lot. So um, he said, basically, Matthew, you've given me a... a one-on-one -on -one photo tour would you ever consider leading photo tours i think that was it was great it was great hanging out and you showed me some some good stuff you helped me get shots i wouldn't have otherwise been able to get you should think about it um and uh so that kind of got the wheels turning um um getting started you know there's a lot of people doing photo tours and as a guy in my early 20s at the time i thought I don't want to be just another person who goes to Bosky because you, you may know how spectacular Bosky Del Apache is. And there's a number of um, photo tours that go there and a lot of people go there on their own. And I thought, well, what do I really have to contribute? Um, and, and yeah, what, what do I have to contribute? And I, I thought about how, um, this is a picture of Ohio here in the background of Lake Hope actually. Um, it's, uh, Ohio is a, is a, is a beautiful place and, um, it's not always easy to photograph in Ohio, but, um, I thought with my, my background in birding, I might be able to get some people some unique images. And, um, I had a special interest, I think, in songbirds, um, for whatever reason. So I thought, um, go with that, develop, develop that, follow that. Um, so yeah, um, early on, um, I, I, I wanted to find a niche and I, I was very obsessed with trying to be original, finding my voice. And when I lead tours now, I still hear a lot of people talk about wanting to find their voice as a nature photographer, wanting to be original. Um, and that's all natural. That's good. It's not, it's not a bad thing to think about. Here's a quote from one of my uh, author I used to read a lot. Um, no man who bothers about originality will ever be original. Whereas if you simply try to tell the truth without caring two pence how often it has been told before, you will nine times out of 10 become original without ever having noticed it. So I, I really like that quote. Um, and I, I've tried to let that happen and not pursue originality for its own sake. So when people talk to me about this, about and when I was trying to find my initial direction, um, I think originality can happen finding your own voice can happen in a couple of different ways first um developing a style you don't necessarily have to seek it out you just do exactly what you like in the way you like to do it just uh listen to your own voice and also look at thousands of images analyze why you like certain images and why others don't appeal to you and do that in your own work as well um what's working what's not um kind of going through critical thought process on why you like what you like. And then um, one of my favorite um, photo uh, nature photographers now is Vincent Munier. He'll go to many different locations, but he has a very specific um, set of visual things he's interested in. One is um, silhouettes. And I could recognize his portfolio from anywhere, 
even though he goes to so many different places, just because he really um, pursues those few things that he really likes. And then you can also, um, I think, develop um, an intriguing portfolio by simply photographing what you like or where you like. So maybe you have a favorite local spot or maybe you have a heart for Africa. Um, you know, do that. And I, I, I guess my advice to young Matthew and to other people who ask me this question is to just, just do what you like unapologetically and passionately. And, um, and you'll, you'll, you'll find what your, what your voice is that way rather than just trying to seek it um, directly. Um, I don't know if uh, Norm Kikuchi is part of your group, but his name comes to mind right away. Um, in California, he, he's just done so many outings with Clarks and Western Grebes, and his portfolio is amazing. Um, like it's, it, just, it just sings because he's pursued this one thing passionately. I love it, so just as an example. Um, so here's what I found out I love. I love a quiet experience with nature, and I think the older I get, the more I really value um, the, the experience. Um, and I, and partly because of that I've chosen to have really small photo tours. It just kind of, it's a different experience when you have a big group. Um, and a, a unique experience, not a bad one, but, um, but I'm more drawn to like a quiet one with nature. And I really like being in a beautiful location if possible. Um, I have, I have like a couple uh, warbler trips. One is in Northern Ohio where I go to some of my favorite metro parks around Cleveland. It's a perfectly fine trip, we get good images, but you have to kind of negotiate Cleveland suburbs in the meantime. And I'm, I'm really not doing that so much anymore. I really am drawn to the big, beautiful spaces. Even if the photos you walk away with are the same, I really, I just like being in a beautiful place as part of it for me. Um, and I guess uh, along with that sort of sense of zen, I like space in my composition. Um, I've learned that I love natural colors usually, and sometimes I'll even desaturate them. Not always. Um, I have a special love for songbirds, and I also really like grand landscapes and nature in context. So whenever I can include, it's not always possible, but if I can include um, uh, something in the image that tells part of the story of the of the place or the species, I really like that. Um, and I have a passion for my home state of Ohio and Arizona and Alaska. I, I fall in love with those places and I could easily go nowhere else for the rest of my life and be completely content. I just really love them. And then, um, like Tom said, I really like sharing my experiences with other people. Um, my grandfather was, uh, uh, um, actually had an art school and I think maybe I got some of that from him. And for a few years, I didn't even photograph myself on my own photo tours. I just really, it's just really fun for me to find stuff in the field and watch other people get it. Um, I love making images too. Uh, and I actually, I now take pictures on the tours most of the time um, because I think it helps let me share what we got and um, help, gives me like real time feedback in the field so I can modify as, as we go. But um, so Ohio is blessed to have one of the nation's number one um, migrant spots for especially for warblers it's called mcgee marsh in ohio and it's amazing there's there's a lot of birds but they're kind of buried in the bushes and as you can see it's like elbow to elbow so i used to go here every year and um and by kind of critically analyzing what i love this is this is not it for me it's a great spot you can it's especially for birding but um for me it's more just in south southern ohio way back on backcountry roads where there's no one around and you just it's just you and the birds you know and maybe a couple of photographers with you i really love that um so that's where i started um with the direction is uh is southern ohio and songbirds that i love and small groups um and uh let's see this is actually just down the house, down the street from my house um, in Northern Ohio. And we have so many beautiful songbirds here with the scarlet tanager and indigo bunting and down to actually some, some less colorful but really interesting species, but there's this huge diversity. And um, they all come here uh, late April, early May. And um, 
I'll do some work with setups like this at a blind, but for the most part, we're just driving through the forest. Like Tom said, I have my window down, I'm listening for what's singing. And when I hear something that's singing that we might want to photograph, um, I'll radio to any, sometimes there'll be another car following me and uh, say, oh, I'll, I'll test the bird. Um, more often than not, I'm using something to attract the bird, either food or water or out east, it's often a call, either the bird's own call or like a vireo scold or something like that. So I play a test, a test call to see if the bird is interested because most either ignore it completely or, or um, you know, just aren't too interested. So I'll, I'll test a number of birds and when I find one that seems like it has a good response, we'll get out of the car, I'll say this one looks good, and um, do a little setup. Sometimes we're just trying to get them um, what, you know, where we already see them hopping around. Um, a lot of times I'm putting a, a speaker near, like in this case, a redbud tree and just have them work through the redbud tree. And other times I'll do a setup where we really don't get the shot unless they land exactly where we want. And I call that an all or nothing setup, which is never as ideal, but it can work. You have to have a more responsive bird, but, um, here's a Louisiana water thrush from Southern Ohio. And it's an all or nothing setup with a log and a speaker under the log. And uh, the stream bank was just too, too steep for us to get down there. So we were able to get the bird up on that perch. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I, that's how I started my trips. And that's still the core of what I do. I really love warblers. Um, and spring in the Eastern forest is just, is just fantastic. Um, when people come on a, on a warbler photo tour, um, a lot of times out east, here they want to see cerulean warbler, um, which is understandable because it's really beautiful. It's also declining quickly and it's hard to find and photograph. Um, so I've kind of keyed in on where they are and how to get them as reliably as possible. And they're definitely one of my three three favorites. I, I'd say cerulean, um, blackburnian, and red-faced warbler are, are the top for me, but I, I like them all. But um, so I'll put out often a little a little branch that has a good background and um, if they don't hit that then there's something else in the area that if they don't come all the way we might get some shots in this case I was just really lucky that I didn't even see there was a, a daddy long legs crawling on the branch that the, the cerulean snatched up and here's just a, a natural branch that I didn't set up that I like just as well or more um, it has a bit of se a, kind of a sense of depth um, in in sub Appalachia and parts of Ohio, there's really steep hills. So you can be photographing a warbler that's 20, 25 feet off the ground, but it's eye level with you because it's a steep bank on the side of the road. And uh, we often get, we get quite a bit of rain here in Ohio. Um, we often get a brief shower or two on a trip, but that leaves all the, all the bark really dark and the color saturated and it's really beautiful. Um, we'll even photograph in light rain. And uh, like on this shot, I loved how the, the water droplets accumulated on the leaves. Kind of gave a, a, a feeling to the image. And sunshine's nice too. So when people visit, um, I get a lot of questions on where to go what, for uh, different target birds. And this is just an example. People, someone might ask, can I photograph cerulean warblers while I visit my parents in central Illinois, but fill in the species name and the place name. Could I visit, could I, you know, could I photograph a uh, black throated gray when I go to Washington? Um, so uh, a good starting place is the good old fashioned field guide. Um, and I, by the way, I really recommend getting a copy of, of a field guide. I grew up with the Petersons uh, guides and I really like them. Um, but it, it, I think it helps give a context that I noticed some people lack, people who've just started birding. Um, when you're just flipping through or selectively looking at uh, specific species on a field guide app, I think it's easy to miss um, the, the context of the species inside its family and see the side-by-side -side comparison to other members of its family. And, um, and then just the nice um, information that you can quickly see and the range map next to the species. It, I think it's a, I don't know about better, but different and very valuable learning experience. But um, you look at these range maps 
and you want to answer the question, can you get a cerulean warbler in, um, when you visit your parents in central Illinois? Well, according to this range map, you could. It's right, uh, right there. It's there in all of Illinois, so sure. Um, but uh, um, with new uh, data, just an incredible amount of data, often compiled by eBird, um, we now have these, um, these range maps to give us so much more information. And I like to say, the more you know about birds, the better images you can create. So this is a really cool tool that, that we have now, and that's uh, relative abundance maps. Um, so so here's, here's the new map, the way we should have it. Um, and you'll see that cerulean warblers do, in fact, live in Illinois, but almost, almost not at all. I mean, they're there. So um, the old range map is correct that you can color in the state of Illinois as a place that they breed, but they're hard. I mean, they're, it's not a good place at all to go. Um, you can see the heart of the range is Southern Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky. And then uh, what's better, oh, so this is where you can find those maps. It's ebird.org slash science slash status and trends. Love those maps. I could just pour through them for hours. Um, but they, they made these dynamic maps as well. So I'm going to press play here. And um, on the right side, you can see weeks of the year. And the map is going to change in this, as this bar shifts from January through December. Um, so you can see that they winter here in South America. And then, um, then around April, they just explode into North America. And their breeding range in Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky. Allegheny Plateau, and then back. Isn't that cool? I just, I just love that, and um, I love studying those. Um, timing is everything for me. I think for a lot of us, birds do their thing and then they, then they get gone. Um, so on my trips, one of my problems with starting a photo tour business specializing in in warblers is that, in my mind, there's about a ten day window where um, things are perfect. When the male birds first arrive on territory, they're very conspicuous. They're singing their hearts out. They tend to be more responsive and the foliage tends to just be coming out and there's a lot of flowers. It's, you know, it's perfect. And outside that range, they're either not there or they're not very responsive or they're, you know, feeding young, um, not as good. It's a very narrow time frame. Um, and so, so in Southern Ohio, I have 10 days. But I found that by going to Northern Ohio, I have almost a totally different 10 days. Um, and uh, looking at these maps can really tell you a lot on when the time frame is for the bird um, when, and when it just arrives on territory. Um, on the songbird photo tours, uh, I often talk about it being a numbers game as well. So I had a woman on one of my Michigan trips I now go to Northern Michigan as well because they have a slightly different date range of when their birds breed um, late May, they arrive there um, and have a different set of species as well. It's great, I love, I love Northern Michigan. Um, so as this woman who came on my trip, I like to ask people, what do you hope to photograph? And um, you know, what are you hoping to learn? And she said, the only thing I really want is black throated blue warbler and also it's my birthday. <laughs> So um, I said, okay, no pressure. Um, the problem for me is that, uh, is that it, it, as a numbers game, certain species are just more responsive and easier than others. Like I think of Northern Perula warbler um, as maybe coming in every other bird. And uh, black throat blue is one of the tough ones. I would say one in 15 or so. Um, Scarlet tanager might be one in 15, one in 20. So it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that if you want to get one, you have to plan on finding uh, 15 or 20 individuals. And if you, if you don't do that, then your chances are iffy. So I, I told her that, you know, we'll, I'll try them as I find them and, uh, and we'll see. And uh, <laughs> she said, okay, fair enough. Very nice. And she was kidding about the birthday. I mean, it was her birthday, but um, so we, I heard one, the first one we heard, I pulled over and I gave it a test and it shot out of the woods. It looks pretty good. So we set up our cameras. Um, I played the call with our camera set up and it landed on the end of this woman's lens. It was so cool on her birthday. But 
Um, yeah, that was awesome. But that's also the the, the exception. Um, it's a numbers game, so if you want to if you want to get a tough bird, you just have to find enough and try enough, and and you'll get it. Um, Brian Small actually kind of mentored me a little bit early on, and he's he. I, I would ask him like, how did you get that shot? That's like, I I can never, it just, that bird seems impossible. What secret trick are you using? And he would say, Matthew, you just got to find the right bird on the right day. So that's been my mantra since is find the right bird on the right day and you'll get it. Um, you know, practice, patience pays off. Uh, another one from Northern Michigan, one of my favorites, black and warbler. Here it is in New York at last light. Um, lately, if I feel like I've got a lot of photos of them sitting on a perch and I'm like, I don't know what else I could do. It's sitting there. I've got the shot. It's great. I've actually started taking little video clips and I really enjoyed that. I don't know if you guys have, have experimented with your video at all or not. Um, this is one of my favorite shots of a black Brunian that I've got. I like it because it has a sense of depth as the, as the pine branches recede out of focus. And it has a fairly cool color palette, um, which really makes the uh, the orange and the yellow pop visually. And I had a, I was with a couple in Michigan who really wanted black Bernian, and usually they're doable, but this trip I had to work for it a bit. And we got this, and they said oh, that was beautiful, Matthew, but um, but uh, you know we can't see its feet, and and for them. Um, the, one of the joys of photography for them is entering their images in contests, which is which is great. I think all of us have get something different out of out of this bird photography thing. For some of us, it's more of an excuse just to be in a beautiful place with nature, maybe more experience uh, driven. And for others, it's more results driven, and the results could be a book they're making or it could be a contest. Um, so it's all valid. Um, but, uh, so in this particular group, um, if you didn't have the feet showing, it was like major points off. And I, I understand that it is nice to see the feet, but I like this image anyway, but it brings up an interesting point, um, that comes up a lot. Um, there's a lot of great places to share work, uh, subgroups and critique forums. And like I mentioned, getting your images critiqued in um, a bird photography group or an online forum is a really valuable way of learning. In fact, in some ways, I feel like that gave me more than um, some of my college experiences. Um, and uh, I was I was a moderator for naturescapes.net for a long time on their birds forum. Um, Birdphotographers.net is Arthur Morris's. I think in recent years, um, some of the uh, photo critique forums like these, um, the the membership has dwindled as people are sharing more and more on on other uh, like Instagram and Facebook, um, but they're still they're still active and very very valuable. Um, they can turn into kind of like a, a format for advertising too, but that, that I guess that's everything. But um, anyways, um, I find that in any of these subgroups, um, the groups have um, they kind of develop their own like set of artificial rules and that provides a framework to learn so much but I also um, like to, to remind people that um, that you're the artist you're the boss so if uh, if you're part of a group that needs to see the feet all the time in the bird photo and you have a photo that you took that doesn't show the feet then um, then trust yourself um, I guess I see that a lot on my photo tours in that it, 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 people starting out, they may be very good, um, and they 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 have they have a voice. They're making great images, but they're not sure. They don't know if it is great or not. They're not sure whether to trust what they're doing, because maybe they they haven't had enough feedback and so forth. Um, but but I think that's important just to like to to learn what you can, to analyze what's working and what's not, but then to um, to trust. Trust what you love and follow what you love. This image of the prairie warbler is not for everyone. I, some people don't like it at all, but I really do. Um, it it has some things in common with that Robert Bateman painting I showed in the beginning of the Scarlet Tanager, 
um, has a diverted gaze. Um, it's the most saturated point in the, in the frame, but it's not totally dominant in the frame in terms of size. It's sitting on a branch that has a bunch of uh, some visual interest and gives a little context. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not traditional in a lot of ways. And a lot of people don't like it and that's okay. It's okay to make some work that not everyone likes. Um, here's one that's a little more traditional, but lots of space. Um, another um, uh, color palette that's um, fairly homogenous. And uh, there it is singing on a, a sassafras limb. <clears throat> this is a little more traditional, um, bigger in the frame. And one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately and have been for a while, um, it'd be an interesting discussion sometime, and that is how how much of our work is displayed and viewed on social media like Instagram, where you're looking at, at these things on a small phone. And when you have um, a, an image that has lots of space and the subject matter is fairly small, it almost doesn't register um, on, on, you know, on your phone. Um, so it kind of like skews, I think, sometimes what we produce or look at or like um, because of the format that we're viewing it. Um, should it? Does it need to? I don't know. Interesting discussion. Something to think about in your own work. Blooming Warbler. Um, I loved the dew on the, on the drops. Um, I'm just going over through uh, some of my favorite uh, warblers on the Eastern trips. Um, these starburst shapes are spent hawthorn blossoms that have dropped the petals. And when I, when I call a, a blooming warbler in, I often like to have uh, hawthorn or apple blossoms because it picks budworms out of the blossoms, um, even if they're spent. So here, um, going through apple blossoms, and it's more likely to land because it wants to go to these things anyways. Um, and it's beautiful, and it's interesting to see that behavior. Um, in contrast, a black and white warbler isn't as likely to be on a dainty branch looking through apple blossoms. It's going to be creeping along um, stuff with heavy bark and lichen, picking underneath the lichen and bark for bugs. Um, this was not a perch I set out. It was just this, this whole area was filled with um, these perfect little sticks that were absolutely beautiful. Um, I loved the background in this as well. Um, Yellow-throated warbler. Again, the, uh, the dark bark of the red bud tree after a rain, which is love. Hooded on a wet red bud branch. Can't get enough. And uh, just as a, another example of a range, you can see hooded warblers um, spend much of the year in Southern Mexico and Central America and then uh, radiate out into the eastern U.S. for a brief time. Um, they're more distributed through the southern states. That's one great thing about Ohio is we have a selection of the warblers like hooded that are more southern birds, and then another separate selection of uh, warblers that are more northern, like black-throated green. Here's the composite. Worm meeting warbler more subtle, um, but it's still beautiful. It doesn't hurt to have them dressed up on a nice, on a nice uh, branch though. Um, in this case, this is a perch I set out. I observed this warbler going through dead leaves in the forest floor, um, which is what they always do. And so just like I put up the, uh, the apple blossom or the hawthorn branch for the um, blueing warbler, um, putting up the dead leaves for this bird um, helps attract it and um, I think made for a visually interesting image and also kind of helps us, uh, it tells a story about the bird. So I love it. I love doing that when it works out. One of the classic Southern warblers, um, spending the winters, Southern Mexico, Central America. Uh, Prothonotary warbler. So they're the only species to nest over open water in uh, tree cavities and they're always around the slow moving water, um, cattails on the edges. And so this image made perfect sense. I was thinking about this recently. Um, if you knew nothing about birds, 
I think if you had a Northern Cardinal sitting on top of a cattail, it would, in theory, look, you know, just as good. But knowing something about the birds, that would make no sense at all, right? So I think the more you know about the birds, the more appropriate um, images you can make, the more interesting images you can make. Um, and I really like that aspect of, of bird photography. You, there's almost no, no end to how you can delve into, into this and you just keep learning and learning. Um, American Red Start, love these guys. They don't fan their tails nearly as often as the uh, painted red starts in Arizona. So um, I was happy to capture this. Um, this one photographed in New York and uh, some people wanted to crop this so that they lost the uh, out of focus blossoms on the left. I don't know what you guys think. Both opinions are valid. I liked it. It kind of seemed a little more painterly um, and gave some depth for me. And uh, here we were trying to capture the tail fan. This bird kept landing on one particular spot on one perch very reliably and you could see him coming. So I had everyone just hammer away when we saw it coming over, hoping to get the tail fan and um, actually really lucked out and got the wings up a couple times too. It was a lot of fun. Red start, um, same map pretty much as we've seen before, except also um, wintering in Cuba and a more northern range, expanding pretty far in the northwest, but then wintering kind of where we've seen all of these guys. Um, I photograph vireos and anything, you know, all the songbirds, but I'm really focused on warblers today, but we, we did, we'll, I'll photograph whatever we can. Connecticut warblers, those are really tough. Um, Kirtland's in Michigan. Um, so a lot of times I'll put out a perch and the birds will find an insect there that I didn't realize was there. But also lately I've had a lot of fun actually putting my own, I've been trapping moths and flies and stuff. And then I, I put that on, on a branch where we want the bird. And um, it, it usually doesn't work, but when it does, it's a lot of fun, something to try. Indigo buntings, can't resist. Um, I love how they have kind of a, a turquoise on their back when they first arrive. And then as the summer wears on, they become more and more indigo until they're truly deep blue. Um, they range throughout the Eastern US and then um, have a larger wintering range as well, a little further north into Mexico. Um, getting birds on perches. Um, so I've found there's a lot of tips. It's like a lesson in itself, but um, they like perching on the tallest part of a small branch. They tend to, they like to perch on something sturdy. Um, so you'll see like this, this pine warbler um, isn't as likely to be on those delicate needles. It, cause it might fall off. I mean, once in a while they'll do that, but chances are strong that it's going to want to land on a, on a heavy part of the perch. And um, it's easier for them to land on horizontal branches, or in this case, the feet are side by side rather than um, one well above the other. So uh, I don't know what you think about this shot. It's, so it's a pine warbler on a pine, and it's the kind of pine that they nest in. So in that sense, it tells a story. It's also getting there as far as over the top for me. Um, it's, it's a delicate balance to um, when you're, when you're, inserting yourself in the situation and using some level of control over where the bird lands and so forth. Um, it's nice to choose something that makes sense with the bird and tells a story. And it's nice to choose something that's visually interesting, but also to not push it so far for me um, that it starts looking too cont contrived, which this is starting to, but it's still cool. I'm not gonna delete it. Um, this was a really aggressive individual, um, put out the, out of the branch, he landed right there, snap, snap, and noticed that he didn't eat the bugs. Um, you'll often see a bird with a bug in its mouth. It, they almost always consume it immediately. And if they fly anywhere with the bug, they may have like one caterpillar that they're bashing over the side of a log um, and knocking the, the, the fur off of it um, or killing it, and then they eat it. But you're never really gonna see a bird 
with like stacked a beak full of bugs that it's not eating. That means it's feeding young. So when you hear people talk about like judicious use of recordings, I think that's a good category. And um, is if, you know, if you see a bird feeding young, it's probably best to leave them do that. Um, and then that's another reason why I talk about having a 10 day window that's ideal. Um, in any given region, Southern Ohio, for example, um, the best 10 day window is about April 20th to April 30th. That's when most of the birds are sitting up territory. Pine warbler, however, arrive about a week or two before the others. So unfortunately when I'm there, sometimes I'm a little late for some of those species, but it's also a good thing. Like if you're, um, you know, where you are in California, uh, some birds, especially out in uh, dry areas like thrashers or owls set up very early and then other birds like flycatchers usually set up later. So you can kind of extend your, your season and what you go after. And you can also change that by what elevation you travel to. So, um, so I love warblers and songbirds. I'm really focusing on that today. And my love of those led me to Arizona. Um, and it lets me extend my season too. Um, so I can kind of follow spring north. I'll start in Southern California, Florida, and Arizona. Um, Arizona really gets going with their warblers in the first and second week of April. And then I move to Southern Ohio, which gets going the last two weeks of April. And then New York and sometimes Northern Ohio and then Michigan. And then I finally end up in Nome, just below the Arctic Circle. Um, which gets going the first two weeks of June. And then finally Barrow all the way up as far as you can go um, north. And they don't get started with their spring until the third week of June. So um, by, by starting down south and then following all the way up north, I can kind of hit that 10 day window from you know March through June and just have a really long spring. I love it. Um, Arizona. Uh, everyone wants to see the red-faced warbler, and understandably so. They're really beautiful. Um, again, hard to find. Um, a lot of fun to find. And again, I'm just driving slowly with the windows down. I'm looking for the right habitat. I'm listening for them to call. And when I do, um, start looking around for an area that could possibly have a clean background and so forth. Um, I'm often looking for leaves that aren't huge and kind of obstruct the bird um, or pines, um, smaller diameter branches. It all kind of comes together to make a more attractive image. Um, here's a black throated gray warbler, one that goes way up into California. This photographed in Arizona. <clears throat> and your, your songbirds out west tend to have a range map that looks a little bit more like this. Um, they don't usually go as far down into Central and South America, um, tend to stick to the West Coast of Mexico, and sometimes don't even go down to Mexico. In the case of Olive Warbler, which I photographed in Arizona, um, they actually migrate just by going down the mountain. They'll be up at, you know, uh, 7,500 feet up to 9,000 feet or so in breeding, uh, in the breeding season, and then they'll go down to 3,000 feet or wherever they need to to find bugs um, during the winter. It's a lot, a lot easier than flying thousands of miles. I really liked this shot with the looser framing and uh, some of the autofocus pine in the background. Painted red start, love these guys. And one of the most boring looking warblers, Lucy's, redeemed redeemed itself by having the wings up and pecking for bugs on an octatio blossom. The smallest warbler actually. And um, I mean, warblers are great. There's only, I guess, seven or eight that we usually get in Arizona, um, specialty species, but we also go after the other songbirds, bridal titmouse, Scott's Oriole, um, um, snack catcher on creosote bush. Very small in the frame, doesn't hold up on Instagram that well, but I loved the textures of the of the creosote bush and subtle colors of the of the shade on the foreground and then last light hitting the background. <clears throat> Proloxia. And uh, 
<laughs> there's a guy in Southern Arizona who has some road runners around his house and they're kind of accustomed to, um, to people. So I fed this one, a, a native tarantula. It was a lot of fun. Um, but I don't know if you guys have seen Tom Ingram's shot of this guy battling a, uh, a rattlesnake is pretty epic. It's really amazing. Love Arizona. Greyhawk. There's so many specialty species down there in just a small corner of the state that you couldn't get anywhere else in the U.S. And then we do some natural light hummingbird photography. Um, Arizona has so much light that doing natural light hummer photos is pretty easy. So, um, you know, just using direct light, we'll go for a shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second will do it pretty easily. Um, and it uh, looks, I think, a little bit better than multi-flash setups, but multi-flash can look great. And sometimes it's the only way, like in the tropics. Um, I go further north, Nome. Um, just show a couple quick shots from there. Um, Nome is pretty diverse. There's some songbirds. There's actually seven warblers but I also love the, the muskox and the shorebirds on breeding territory and um, ptarmigan, loons. There's just so much there. And that's uh, early June. And then I end up in Barrow on the North Slope. And that finishes up. Actually, it, it used to finish out the breeding season. Now I actually do a second visit to Arizona during monsoon season. And uh, some birds don't get started breeding there until the monsoon rains of late July hit, like varied bunting and uh, bottery sparrow. So that extends spring even that much further. Um, yeah, Barrow's a unique place. Um, I met a guy named John Crawley in Barrow, and we've since become friends. And he's um, introduced me to quite a few people and um, uh, has started co-leading some trips and leading some of my trips and uh, actually introduced me to Corey and Kathy Raffle, who were part of your group, which I didn't realize until the announcement went out. And it was in Costa Rica that I met Corey and Kathy. Um, John, who I met in Barrow. Um, to this point, I had just focused on what I would call the ABA continental area. If you're an old school birder, I feel like I'm not old enough to be an old school birder, but I got started young. If you're an old school birder, you would have like a number and uh, you'd go to the local birding club and you'd be like, so you're at uh, 394, huh? Well, you'll get there, you know, and then someone else would walk in and be like, that guy, he has, you know, 715, woo. It, it, it was, it's a fun game. Um, it's like so many of us have different objectives and ways of enjoying being out there. It's just one way, and um, like an excuse to find something new, nothing wrong with it. Um, but uh, the ABA Continental Area is what I grew up with, is what the field guides cover. Um, it's what I learned from the start. And I thought, um, you know, in the, in the vein of um, finding a niche and doing what you love, I don't see ever needing to go out of that space. I, I love it. I know it. Um, but uh, John just kept showing me shots of Costa Rica and, um, and convinced me to go. And I'm so glad I did. Um, uh, Costa Rica is, is it's amazing. Uh, there's so much diversity and uh john's now leading trips for me down there um the living is easy or it can be i mean there's so much you can get just from um from all these eco lodges that set everything up for you um it seems like you just put out bananas here's a bunch of bananas and honey creepers all over them and some tanagers um, you guys, if you've been to Costa Rica, you've no doubt been to Laguna de la Garta, which is where this is. Um, you just sit on a porch and they serve you coffee and you photograph this stuff. It's just fantastic. Lush and beautiful and, I mean, reasonable accommodations. But then you can also go out into the jungle and find some of the, some of the um, stuff that isn't as often seen. 
the hummingbirds here are incredible. There's so many species. Um, here they are in front of a multi-flash setup, but no flashes. Um, that's just amazing. Um, I went down to Costa Rica. I had to come back with an image of a monkey. So I, I found this guy with a boat who told me he could get monkeys up close. So I went through the swamp um, to find these monkeys. And who should I find in that swamp but a whole bunch of prothonotary warblers. And I, I saw them and I'm like, hey, I know you. Um, it was kind of like seeing old friends. It was kind of, kind of strange. Um, but sure enough, prothonotaries are down there. Um, and then, so John, who introduced me to Costa Rica, also introduced me to his local contacts, and they, in turn, introduced me to their local contacts. Um, this is the yard of someone who I only know as Nice Lady, and that's John and his local contact. Just, that's, I don't know what her real name is. She's Nice Lady. She's nice because she serves us lunch, and she puts out bananas for us, and she has a huge assortment of, um, hummingbirds coming into her, her native flowers and uh, tanagers coming into the, to the food she has out. Uh, yeah, the, the tanager diversity down there is pretty amazing. And oh, uh, a summer tanager. I know that guy. And the Baltimore Oriole coming into bananas, mind you. Tennessee Warbler, I know him. And uh, flitting around the yard is also um, a golden wing warbler. This I did not photograph there. This is a from my Michigan portfolio. Um, I took a bunch of pictures of some of the native birds, um, some of the birds that I know uh, from Ohio down there, but most of them didn't turn out as well as I would hope. At least they weren't like the ones I get on breeding territory up here. So I deleted them because I was like, I already have good shots of that species, but now I wish I had kept, kept them because it'd be interesting to just show them in that context. Um, People ask me a lot about deleting images, and I'd say, you know, digital memory is cheap. So as long as you can organize them, why, why, why delete too much? Um, but you have to call something. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm down there, and I, I, I'm seeing all the birds that kind of got me excited as a kid and that started my career, and it kind of brought me full circle. I um, started thinking about how... Uh, these are really only ours for if they're if they're unsuccessful for two months and if they're successful at breeding the adults will be here for three three and a half and the rest of the year they're down there they're really we're just borrowing them um, and, and then it was also interesting being co Costa Rica because um, you drive through the countryside and you see their agriculture um, just like you see ours um, rows of uh, monoculture in this case coffee yeah, just interesting to see because, I mean, some of you are very widely traveled and that's excellent. I had committed to being an ABA continental guy. And so I hadn't really, I mean, I, I've traveled, but not really into the, you know, I've been, I've been a tourist before, but I hadn't seriously pursued uh, bird photography um, in another place until a couple of years ago. So it was interesting to see all of this in context. Um, you drive along, and here's another coffee plantation, and I, I suppose this is uh, shade grown because it has uh, some uh, some fruit trees over it, um, and uh, and that brought up an interesting discussion with Corey and Kathy Rappel, who were there, and um, they were talking to me. Um, so I had this general sense that that you know there's this thing called shade grown coffee and that in theory it's better for the eastern warblers that helped me get my start and that i'm passionate about and that helped me earn my living but um but that a um you know uh how much better is it and b the only <laughs> the only shade grown coffee i've ever had tasted disgusting so um so i brought this up to Corey and kathy and he was very informative, um, talking to me about how that plantation that I just showed you with the uh, the banana trees at the top, it may be shade grown, but it's, there's like all different levels. Um, there, you know, the kinds of trees come into play, the height of the trees, the species, the number of species of trees, what else is in the understory. Um, and uh, I got I got this 
illustration with permission from a company called Birds and Beans. Um, so yeah, I talked about this with Corey and Kathy and I mentioned too bad that shade grown coffee is disgusting. <laughs> and Corey said, that's not true. Um, in fact, there's some that, uh, that I have and why don't, why don't uh, me and Kathy ship one to you? So they did, I got home from Costa Rica and there it was along with some information about it, including this illustration. And, uh, and it was just the best coffee I'd ever had. Here's another coffee plantation. This is making some progress, right? Over the, over the plantation with the bananas over it. We have some tall, mature trees. And when you see something like this down there, you can start to think, okay, like I could see that making a difference. Um, here's a young coffee plant. So coffee plants originally were shade plants, and then they were, um, they were developed to be sun tolerant, which helped them grow in monocultures, making them easier to um, harvest, and also helped them resist uh, some, some fungus and diseases. Um, so it was just more efficient, but it also meant clearing the forests of where all these birds that I love spend the winter, or you know, spend most of the year, and it, that leads to soil erosion and um, a bunch of other negative things. And now here's a, here's an uh, official, official bird certified shade grown coffee plantation. It looks like a forest, right? And the birds agree. Um, so another thing that came along with the coffee that uh, Corey and Kathy sent me was a brochure with that illustration and talking about um, um, what, what the different levels are um, of what they're looking for when it comes to certification and what actually makes a difference. Um, so some stats are that 42 of our 54 Native American warblers use shade-grown coffee forms on winter territory. The ones that don't tend to be the, the few Western species actually. Um, over the last 40 years, we've lost 50% of our, of our songbirds. Um, and so the canopy trees, foliage cover, number of trees and plants in the, in the forest and the height makes a big difference. Um, and then you look at where a coffee comes from, it's, it's called the coffee belt. And if this map looks familiar, it looks kind of like the winter range map of all the species I just showed you. Um, that's why I was seeing them down in Costa Rica. And uh, that's why the, the coffee farms I was seeing and talking about and learning about um, kind of um, were interesting and brought this whole thing full circle. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, there's a variety of coffee companies that have this um, bird friendly status and the bird friendly status means that it's organic and it has um, a certain level of biodiversity in the plantation that means that the, it's sufficient for birds to spend the winter there. And Smithsonian Institution is the one who does the certification. So um, you look for the birds and beans, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the bird friendly authorization from Smithsonian. Um, that'll, that'll help ensure that it's not just, you know, you can have coffee plants underneath a couple of banana trees and call it shade grown, but that doesn't do that much for the birds. Um, there's a label again. Um, the one that uh, Corey and Kathy sent me is called um, Birds and Beans. It's by that company. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I've agreed with you, Kathy, that um, the uh, espresso is my favorite as well. Um, and then, uh, so I contacted Birds and Beans and uh, told them I wanted to give this presentation and asked their permission to use some of their photos and talk about them. And they said that would be fine. And um, I also mentioned I am a photographer and if they wanted to use my images. So actually they've already started um, using some of my shots for their marketing, which I'm flattered for although it was free. But they also uh, sent me this picture. They wanted me to mention that um, fair trade is also an important part of the whole equation and not something I'll get into tonight. But, um, but fair trade is, is, is very important. Um, most of the pickers down there make less than $5 a day and um, have big families to feed. And so, uh, so you add all that together and, um, and it's still not that expensive. It's like Starbucks level expensive. It's not Folgers level, but uh, I mean, it's fantastic. So I was so happy to learn that. I basically I felt guilty um, 
having some knowledge that my consumption pattern was bad for the very things that helped earn me a living. And I felt duplicitous and sad that I thought that my choice was between no coffee um, because shade grown was disgusting and who knows how valuable it was to begin with. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was, um, and, and this whole thing has kind of um, sparked an interest and I've, I'm learning more and more about um, where coffee comes from and where um, more of my products come from. I'm really just starting out on this, but I, I've just really been excited and was interested in how it related to my whole career trajectory and um, my latest uh, venture into Costa Rica. Um, so I'll, I'll, I do my photo tours and people will show up and on the first morning, they'll, uh, they bring this gear with them and a couple of my, I, Competitor isn't the right word because they're also my friends and we all help each other. But a couple guys who have um, kind of going for the same thing as I am. Um, they, they have a background in birding. Um, you know, they have a, a certain aesthetic with uh, clean backgrounds and so forth. Um, they hand out uh, free stuff on their trips with their logo big on it. So one guy hands out these, um, these uh, shoulder pads for tripods, very nice huge logo on it. Another guy hands out these baseball caps with a uh, little uh, LED lights in it. Very cool. So people, um, you know, they, they show up on the first morning and, oh, hey, I, I've been on his trips. What are they like? Oh, wait, what, what's his name again? Oh, I didn't realize. And before I've even introduced myself, they're all talking about the other people's trips, which is very <laughs> aggravating and good for them and good marketing. Um, and I like them. They're my friends. So anyways, I was thinking about what should I give. Um, it, you know, if I were to do something like that. And all my ideas um, seem kind of gimmicky and uh, I just couldn't do it. So uh, <laughs> so on my Eastern Songbirds trips now, um, I actually just, uh, like Corey and Kathy gave me one. I'm trying to pay it forward and give people a bag of birds and beans coffee um, for people to try. I feel pretty good about that. And um, if you all reach under your seats, you'll find a bag of cough. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that joke. Um, but yeah, so th thank you, uh, Corey and Kathy for giving that for me and um, for sparking that interest. And uh, um, thank you guys for having me. Here's my website and my handles on Instagram and my email if you have any questions. But um, uh, I'll unshare my... Uh, screen there and then take it to a question and answers if you guys have any questions okay yeah thank you so much matthew that was a fantastic presentation i really appreciate it now for those of you who have questions um we're going to use the chat feature so you should see a little icon or a button probably at the bottom of your screen if you move your mouse um, it'll say chat so click on that and then you can type in your questions so we'll give uh, some of you a, a moment or two. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm not seeing any typing going on. So maybe there's no questions. Okay, well, okay, then that's it then. Oh, wait, from Bruce. <laughs> Where are the maps again? Can you bring up the screen again? Oh. Tell you what, why don't you, uh, Matthew, why don't you send that to me and I'll post it um, on our discussion group, okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me grab that real quick. I might be able to post it in chat here too. Okay. And it says, what camera gear do you suggest? Oh boy. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I actually switched from um, Canon to Nikon a couple years ago. I'm very happy with it. but. You don't need to. Canon does an excellent job. Nikon does excellent. And a lot of people are going to Sony and have wonderful things to say. I think they're all good choices. Um, I don't think if you have good gear that you're comfortable with, I don't think there's any need to jump ship. Um, that being said, um, if you are trying to get into this, especially for like songbird photography, like I do, um, I'd say um, a 600 millimeter prime 
um, at least 500 with an extender, but 600 or 800 um, prime lens is, is pretty important um, over, over everything else. Okay, and Sridhara says, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I wonder how you feel about calling birds during breeding season. Oh, um, that's, that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> um, and I think it can be done um, in a way that, that's uh, not harmful to the birds. So I wouldn't do it if the bird is uh, feeding young. Um, I wouldn't want to do it to the same bird over and over and over. Um, but I've done it to, you know, birds in my own yard once and that's it and they're fine. What, what I like to see, so when they first show up on territory, their only job is to eat and sing. <clears throat> so if they're eating and singing in front of me, great. If they're sitting there like panting with their mouth open doing neither of those things, that's no good. But um, you hear a lot of people talk about judicious use of recordings. I'd say it's like a lot of common sense stuff. Um, I think that it's, uh, you have to be cognizant of the impact that it may have um, and, uh, and it can be abused. But um, I think, you know, if, uh, if the bird is eating bugs and singing in front of me instead of eating bugs and sitting, you know, it, it, you know 50 feet up in a tree, I think it's okay, but I know there's some, uh, it's good, it's good to think about it. It's good to kind of be considerate of what you're doing. And also to that effect, um, you saw the picture of McGee Marsh, um, in Ohio where people were elbow to elbow. It would never be appropriate to, um, to, you know, um, play a call when everyone is, you know, shoulder to shoulder there or had been there first. Um, just common sense stuff. Um. Okay, well, thank you, Matthew. And um, yeah, if you could send that link to me, um, then, uh, then I'll post that on our discussion group, okay? Okay, great. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's in the chat, but I'll still, I'll still post it, okay? Um, okay. And, uh, Okay, so I think, so that's it for, uh, for tonight's uh, presentation. And thank you all for coming and thank you, Matthew. That was excellent. Thanks so much, everyone.